Hello and welcome to our weekly Parsha Shear with the commentary of the al Kodesh. It's just after Rosh Hashanah. We're in the 10 days of repentance. Saras Mechuva, I hope that your Rosh Hashanah, uh, your prayers, your tefillot, your, your hopes and aspirations for the coming year uh, should be blessed with the endorsement of Hashem is Baruch himself. Um, this week's uh, Shear is sponsored by a very special um, rabbi, uh, a Talmud of mine, it says here, and I'm about to read you a Talmud, um, but that's obviously um, corrective text, whatever that evil scourge is that changes from Talmud to Talmud. Um, uh, but it should say Talmud because he's a Talmud uh, a, Torah, a teacher of Torah. And uh, I wrote about him in one of my, my columns, a remarkable young man. Anyway, he writes the following thing. A Talmud is sponsoring the Shear. This is what he wants me to say. A Talmud is sponsoring the Shear um, as Hakoras Atov, as his thanks to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, on the birth of his son this morning. It was not a poshit situation, a simple situation, um, the pregnancy, and because of, of the Amuna in the Eivishter and Das Torah, and because of his and her um, Amuna and trust in Hashem and Das Torah and taking Torah advice. All through, Baruch Hashem, the mother and baby, are doing very well! Exclamation point or mark. Excellent. We also hope that this year should be much be on our child, to steig, to grow in his learning, and he should grow up to be a true Ebed of Hashem, to be a true servant of Hashem. That's rather beautiful. Uh, so, of course, uh, wish, let me wish Mazalist of Tovs uh, to this. He hasn't written his name, so I'm, perhaps he wants to be anonymous, but he's not anonymous to me. He wanted to know also how much is the sponsor trip to the share. It's simply $180. 180, of course, that's uh, 10 times high. Uh, so it should have 10 times high for his little boy and for him and his wife and his whole family and lots and lots of Jew true Jewish nachas. And that's a nice way to start a new year and start our new year share. Um, also, of course, we're praying for some people who need a Rufo Shalima, Yechesko Yehuda ben Yenta, recovering from serious surgery in their ancestral um, cousin uh, and a dear friend and a very lovely man. Um, he should be returned in full health speedily to his to his dear family. Ita Rifka Basim Esther, I'm quite close to her, that's my, my dear wife, uh, who, as you know, is recovering from a complete or second complete um, knee transplant, not knee transplant, knee replacement. <laughs> she didn't get somebody else's knee. And she got she got a titanium knee. She likes to tell me she's bionic. Um Aurea Chaim Ben Khani Yehudas, that little baby who's waiting for a who is waiting for a transplant. And of course my very dear Rafoil Chai Ben Sora. Uh, who all all of all four should have a Rafoil Shalim. Okay, so I say I hope your your Rosh Hashanah went well. I was with Gateways, um, that uh, very splendid organization, uh, with I think about a thousand people, didn't count exactly, in a hotel in Stanford, Connecticut, uh, over Rosh Hashanah, where I think I spoke six times along with other uh, uh, Rabonim uh, and uh, educators. Uh, a great privilege, and thank you to Rabbi Sushar for once again bringing me to be part of the Gateways team and the Gateways family. Um, and when I was there, um, uh, I had an interesting incident, which I'm going to tell you about in a second. But let's just concentrate for us for uh, uh, a moment on this week's Parsha, which is Miguel. Of course, we'll get two more Parshas to go. And that's the, the conclusion of Sefer Torah. And we simply roll it back and start all over again. The Torah is never finished. Um, uh, the, what was it? So the, the queen when the queen died in England. There's no. There's never. There's never not a king. The king is dead. Long live the king. Or in this case, the queen is dead. Long live the king. The Torah is never finished. Uh, the Torah is finished. Start again. Carry on learning forever and ever. Um, good. So it says Vayelach. Uh, it says Moshe. It goes to the Jewish people and he says the following thing. Vayelach Moshe. Moshe goes Vayedaber El Esad Vorim and he says these things. El Kol Yisrael to the whole Jewish people. But Yamanem, he says to them, Ben Meva Esrim Shana and Aki Hayun. I'm 120 years uh, old today. Of course, he was born and passed away in the same the same day, the same birthday date. Uh, the same day, the day of his Petira, of his passing, the same as his birthday. And it's a, apparently a, a, a Segula, it's apparently a, an indication that somebody was, was a tzaddik if they both live and die uh, on the same day. It suggests that the whole life was a complete one in which you fulfilled all your potential. 
Hashem, uh, no, look, I'm not able to come and go, which is a bit strange because he's just come. But yeah, like he went. And the Alshik says, and all the other commentators say here, that there's something wrong with that. Uh, of course, he could come and go. He, he was no, there was no physical um, uh, shrinking of his abilities, a weakening of his uh, of his powers, and, and neither his physical or his spiritual powers. But then he goes on to say, Hashem Omer Leib, Hashem said to me, Lo Tavar is a Yarnaza, you're not going to pass over the Jordan River, this Jordan River. And Hashem Alekecho, who over the Flech? And Hashem himself is going to pass over the Jordan River. He's going to lead you. And he's going to uh, complete for you on your behalf, uh, or through you perhaps, the conquest of the land of Israel, as he promised to give uh, give it to you through Avram, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, and myself. And that's the story. So it's very, very intriguing here that, again, this crucial point, the Moshe Rabbeinu was physically robust. Um, I, he was vibrant. Uh, there was no... Uh, deduction in any de- to any degree of who and what he was spiritually, intellectually, and physically. But he tells you why he can't come. He says, I can't come because Hashem doesn't want me to come. It's not up to me. If it was up to me, because if you remember from a few weeks ago when we went into this in depth, you wanted to lead the Jewish people. But he says, Hashem has got different ideas. And he bows to Hashem's knowledge. So let me go back to, to Rosh Hashanah. Well, of course, we just finished Rosh Hashanah and leading us into these 10 days before Yom Kippur. And there's so much to say, um, but one um, thing to, I think I'd like to focus on uh, is Rabbi Desla's uh, observation about the fact there are two days Rosh Hashanah. Uh, there wasn't always two days Rosh Hashanah, but the rabbis, the, the great rabbis of, at the time of the Second Temple era decided to uh, impose a second day Rosh Hashanah. Now, there's no problem in adding a second day to, to a festival because if you live outside the land of Israel, that is exactly what happens in every festival, Pesach, Sukkot, etc. We've got an extra day. The question really is, as Sukkot and Pesach are commemorations or are vehicles to focus on basically the same theme, the Jewish people going out from Egypt, and as that is a concept, or rather a mitzvah, which is a daily mitzvah, then adding another day of Sukkot or Pesach to remember what you're supposed to be remembering anyway is no big deal. But adding an extra day to Rosh Hashanah is a big deal because it challenges um, a logical um, uh, satisfaction with the process. And that's simply because, how can you say this is Yom Hadin, which we say on both days? Either the first day was Yom Hadin or the second day was Yom Hadin. You can't have two Yom Hadins. Have two court cases, or can you? And the answer is yes, you can, says Rabbi Esther. The two days of Rosh Hashanah is when the Jewish people, as it were, spiritually had declined from the time of the first temple and needed a second day. The first day for Rosh Hashanah is very intriguing. He draws in all sorts of Kabbalistic uh, sources for this. Is the the harsher of the two days because it's it's the most exacting of the two days because it's the greatest of the Jewish people, the tzaddikim of the generation who are put on trial when it comes to the um, the uh, uh, first day of Rosh Hashanah. And of course, the greatest are held to the, the greatest standards. That day and, and those, those who are put on trial on the first day, that's now moves, moves out of the way as we come to the second day. And the people who are not the greatest of the generation are certainly Y.Y. Y. Rubenstein, and probably, as Rabbi Dessa says, the vast majority of the Jewish people, uh, probably including yourself. Although I'm quite sure there'll be a tzaddik or two uh, who watch this share and Torah anytime or on a YouTube channel. Um, but we are judged on the second day. So what the period we're in now was the, that were led from the second day. The, when the chauffeur was blown, on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, that shofar blow, which fixes the deen, which fixes the, the decree in heaven, the assessment of who individually we are. Remember, each of us, as the Gemara says, passes in front of Hashem to be individually assessed and, and uh, considered vis-a-vis what we did last year and our potential for the coming year. Uh, then that is the period we're in now. That's, talk, that's, that's speaking to us. Now we get 10 days, the tzaddikim, on the first day, uh, that was a done deal. They were tzaddikim. Um, but the, ten, the, the rest of us, we've got 10 days, or now less than 10 days, 
to, as it were, uh, launch an appeal and launch an appeal on our own mind to justify going forward to a second, a second day of, a second year rather, in which we can uh, uh, carry on and hopefully a third year and a fourth year and, and all the years till we get to 120. And that's something, if you remember, a few weeks ago, we talked about when, right at the beginning of the Book of Devorim, and the second partial when Moshe Rabbeinu reports by Eskan and Hashem, and I petitioned Hashem at that time. Um, and what did he petition about? Because they just conquered Sichon and Ox lands. They started the conquest of the land of Israel successfully. It seems to be, as were God smiling with favor at the Jewish people. So Moshe thought, well, maybe he'll smile with favor, with favor on me and reconsider is ruling that I can't lead the Jewish people into the land of Israel, which, of course, in this uh, part, he, he concedes that that wasn't going to happen. But then he was still uh, uh, hoping and petitioning for that to happen. And the word that the Torah uses, and he uses, the Eschanan. You remember we talked about Rashi says that Eschanan is to plead for something uh, without condition or without justification, without a claim for justification. Uh, and he says that even though Sadiqim have what to hang their plea on, I mean, if somebody has led a, an exemplary life, a truly holy life, then it, and in case of Moshe Rabbeinu, that would be an understatement. I mean, there is quite a few things he could allude to, at least allude to, like leading the Jewish people for 40 years and getting them out of Egypt and bringing them the tower, etc. There's quite a few things that he might just have in his resume. He could wink towards heaven when he asks for the opportunity to go into the land of Israel. But Rashi says that even though Tzadikim have something to hang it on, they choose not to. And they just say, please, Hashem, from your point of view, uh, without any nudging from me, um, please let me in. And Hashem said no. But the Kliyokar, if you remember, we pointed out the Kliyokar says, but well, that doesn't make any sense. Rashi knows that none of us can point to great things that we've done in the past as a justification for our future. Um, because anything we did in the past was only because Hashem allowed us, in fact, not just facilitated, but really created the, the, the thing that we did in the first place. After all, whatever we did that was great, we were probably breathing at the time. Uh, I, once, I must go off uh, tangentially. I, I was amused when the, um, the uh, announcement came that the, the late Queen of England, that the doctors were concerned just over a week ago, and they were concerned, and then the full statement was that the Queen has had mobility issues. Well, dead people do have mobility issues, and probably when they were saying that she was can she went to, she, she, they were concerned probably she already passed away, I'm guessing. But um, the time is up, right? The time is up. Moshe Rabbeinu, his time is up. Uh, but when we, he says, um, back then when he thinks his time might be extended, he could still be mobile, and indeed he is mobile. Rashi says he doesn't hang it on anything he's done in the past, because when in the past uh, you didn't have mobility issues, you were still alive, that means that you're breathing. Who allowed you to breathe? Hashem. Your veins had blood coursing through them. No? Hashem made your heart beat. Um, uh, you had the great idea to do whatever it is you wanted to do. Well, who puts ideas into our minds? As the fourth blessing of the Amida says, you give a man, you give a woman, intellect, ideas, thoughts. You come up, you cured uh, polio, and, and you come up with the idea or the discovery of penicillin, etc. all comes from Hashem, and so on and so forth. So what can any human being honestly um, turn around and say, well, look, how about all the fact that I did this, that, 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 and the other thing? Hashem allowed you to do it. So the key organ says something which is incredibly interesting. He says, no, he's not saying that Sadiqim can will point to things they've done in the past, but point to things they want to do in the future. And that's a, that is a legitimate number. Moshe didn't do it, and Sadiqim don't do it, but that is a legitimate thing to, to, uh, to say to Hashem. I, moving on to, uh, into the future, I want, if you just let me get, have another year, then I, I want to achieve this, I want to achieve that. I want to put right the things I've been doing that I, I recognize that I did wrong in the last year. That you can propose, that you can suggest to Hashem. <coughs> so that all of that Moshe has failed in. And therefore, <coughs> this week's cetera, he then just speaks to the Jewish people from the heart. But again, our problem is that uh, he was he was certainly physically robust. So when he says he can't come and go, it's only or so because Hashem said, I can't come and go. And the period we are in here is the period when we are trying to get ourselves right 
and come to be able, when we can say, and I'll, if I have another year, I'll be able to do this, that, and the other. So when I was uh, in in uh, in um, gateways, there are uh, a two minionim, the main minion. I say about a thousand people there, and there's an early minion at six o'clock in the morning for the rabbis and the staff members, the cook, etc., who uh, have to be on duty to make sure everybody is uh, okay during the course of the day. So we have a very early start, and I was asked as I was last year, if I would daven in that minion, and, and also could have blow the shofar, um, something I've done for most of my life uh, in Rosh Hashanah, and uh, something I quite enjoy doing. And so I did last year, and would I do it this year as well? And, and indeed I did. So I did the first day, which was fine. Uh, and I came to the second day, uh, it was just, I think we had about 12 more shofar calls, shofar blasts to make. It was, a, it was only a small minion, 20 people. Um, and then I uh, lifted it to uh, my lips and nothing happened. It just didn't work. This is the chauffeur I was using. Uh, for those who are watching on, on video, it's a very nice chauffeur. Put it to my lips, blows perfectly, but not then. <laughs> and it's one of the most embarrassing things that, uh, that happens. Uh, of course, it happened in the past. Normally you can recover. I just couldn't recover. Only 12 blasts to go, and I'd done it. Um, over 100 shoulder calls, but it just would not work. And of course, the more I struggled, the worse it got. And I'm changing the angle. I have another chauffeur. I always have a, a plan B, just in case that one uh, is better. <laughs> that blows quite nicely too, um, but it wouldn't. And out came a squeak and a squawk. Um, I took this, the, the black one again, or black and white one, I should say. And I, I tried to change the angle on my lip and back and forth, I pressed it harder. My lip started to bleed. I, I, I struggled. I, I, it just went. <laughs> and of course, you're dying of embarrassment and everybody else is starting to get embarrassed. Eventually, having tried every single manipulation of the thing to try and get it to make a sound, it would not. And I had to concede, I just can't do this in the pants of somebody else. Who was able to achieve rather uh, perfectly, incidentally, um, or by Frank, nice fellow, uh, the, the remaining 12 or so chauffeur blasts. And I just did not feel very good about myself. I was told in Manchester, and somebody there was a Talmud of the, uh, the great, late great Manchester Rosh Hashiva, apparently he did this every year. He could never make it work, and yet he would still try to make it work. Um, and we got there and just, I think, just do a few notes and then that was it, he was done. I thought it was strange. In Judaism, of course, three is a chazoka. Why on earth would you, having had a chazoka three years in a row, you just can't do this. Why on earth would you want to carry on doing it? This was not, incidentally, in Gateways, my first chauffeur blowing disaster. My last chauffeur, <laughs> my most recent chauffeur blowing disaster was a much more public affair. As I said, it was, an, a, it was about a thousand people there. Uh, this goes back, I think, about five years. Um, and I was going to blow for the entire Gateways program, the main Gateways program, which, as I said, throughout my life, I had no problem doing this at all. And there, I didn't, I don't think I even managed to get too many squeaks and squawks out of it. Um, it just didn't work. And I had to go out right at the beginning, unfortunately, it was a rabbi, Rabbi Becher, Rabbi Mordechai Becher, uh, an exceptional uh, Tabak um, and very accomplished shovel blower, uh, came rushing up and uh, and saved me, saved me from the uh, embarrassing situation I found myself in and took over. Um, but I thought when this happened to me again this year, not quite as dramatic, not quite so public, a thought entered my mind. I mean, things don't happen by accident. And I was about to speak. I was about to speak before the official public chauffeur blowing for the whole the whole thousand people and I just could not fix in my mind what I wanted to talk about I'd been struggling about it for two days my notebook which is here is all my shiri written down for the uh, for Rosh Hashanah but I, I didn't write um, there it is here's Rosh Hashanah it said uh, that was Sunday it was day one and there's day two if you can see it and there you are look blow the show for um, notes nothing it just hadn't not, I, I just couldn't think of anything I wanted to say that or to say that was important enough that I felt for, 
the Ramayosim and the Leib Nechnosim, the things that would come from my heart, I felt was the real thing to say, would enter other people's hearts. If it doesn't, if I don't feel it, it won't enter other people's hearts. Until this happened, until this disaster happened. So when I stood in front of the audience, it was. I told them the story. I told them what just happened at the six o'clock Indian. And it occurred to me, um, and I wanted to share with them, that perhaps on that second day of Rosh Hashanah, when for almost everybody there, maybe everybody there, that's when, with the chauffeur call, that's when their deen, that's when their fate for the year to come was going to be set, set and sealed. Perhaps the chauffeur, which is supposed to evoke fear, evoke a sincerity and a repentance and a sincere repentance, perhaps the, non, the non-blowing of the chauffeur it was going to be a much more um, uh, appropriate thing to get that sort of, to get the appropriate response than the blowing of the chauffeur. Because you see, when I was wrestling with that chauffeur in that early minion, back and forth, it, it wasn't working. I eventually had, had to concede I couldn't do it and hand it over to somebody else. That mental attitude, that guarantees a very good year because we're very reluctant to give up and to hand over to somebody else. We want to do it ourselves, particularly if we're male. Uh, I'm sure I've told you before, if you ever go to the, the, the council of the Kota Maravi, um, perhaps you're waiting for your wife or your daughters to finish davening, who we tend to take a lot longer than men anyway. So you look over the sort of barrier at the back, trying amongst the thousands of women to spot your wife, maybe uh, wave to her, it's all naive, of course. Uh, but if you look at women davening, they normally have the cedar up close to their to their face. Maybe the face is completely covered with the cedar. Uh, guaranteed, uh, there are going to be tears flowing down their cheeks. They are maybe swaying gently back and forth. They're praying for a sick husband, a sick child, a sick parent, for some other important issue. Um, it might be for pernosa, for, for the income that they're struggling with, or any others, any other thing. But the way that women normally pray is with tremendous uh, sincerity, uh, lots of tears, and um, silent or, or gently petitioning heaven to please reconsider the, the situation they're going through it or make it, make it uh, more gentle. If you switch to the men's side, you often see men dabbling like this. Rabbi Nishalaylam! Fists! fist pointing at heaven. Each one is a Yaku Avinu struggling with an angel to try and guarantee that um, the outcome for the Jewish people is, uh, for, and this particular Jewish person, him, uh, is going to be successful. Uh, Yaku fighting with the angel. Us, men. Men, as my wife says, are fixers. You want to fix things. And when we're fighting with heaven, we are fighting with heaven um, to change that decree. And by the time a man realizes um, that he or she uh, cannot um, change, you know, do it, cannot fix it, often they've done a lot of damage to themselves and certainly to a lot of other people as well. Perhaps the fact that, as it were, sometimes we cannot blow the chauffeur, it just doesn't work. And, and it not working, eventually we have to give up on our, our own faith and our abilities, our own ego, and hand it to somebody else, is the key. And that's exactly what Moshe said here, as the Alshu points out. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I can't go and come. Yes, you can. Yeah, but Hashem said that it's not for me anymore. So I've handed it over to somebody else. I'm going to go over to, you, to, to Yeshua, and Hashem will take you in. It's the point where you say, it's not about me. That's an incredibly important message going into the year ahead. And I'll show you, um, I can't remember I told you this in an, in an, in an earlier year, but this is absolutely stunning stuff. Uh, I told you, I, I came across an, a, a Hasidic Sefer recently called the Bas Ayin, um, the son of a very dear friend of mine, Bobby Hill, Rabbi Abby Hill, made a little video for me for something called Jewish Study Groups. Uh, their alumni, uh, Facebook page, 
And he met, quoted, quoted Vasari, and I liked it very much, and I went and bought myself the two volumes uh, of this uh, book. It's the Rebbe of Avrish. And here, if you remember, in Pasha's Bullock, everybody knows the story of Bullock, Bullock the king, summons Bilam, because the Jewish people, they, he has seen the Jewish people fight, and they don't fight in a natural way. They fight in a supernatural way. And they have a leader who, as it were, can petition God and normally get God to respond. So they need someone who is equally talented, and of course that is Bilam. Um, Bilam is the anti-Avram Avinu. The three outstanding qualities of Avram, his Tomidim, are the antithesis of the of the of the qualities of Bilam and his Tomidim. And one of them is humility. Avram is humble, very humble. He says he doesn't have to be dust. Um, however, uh, Bilam is he's got an ego the size of Manhattan. Uh, and therefore, but he is a prophet. And when he says things, when he curses people, they are cursed. He's a Lord Voldemort, if I can use the Harry Potter uh, imagery. Um, he was able to abadacadabra. cadavera. Uh, incidentally, that is a word taken from Kabbalah, by the way. Um, he's able to curse people, and it's, it, it's, it's potent. But the interesting thing is that Hashem hates people who have an ego. In fact, he famously says in the Talmud, the Talmud states that Hashem says there's only one type of person I cannot coexist with in the world, or rather, cannot coexist in the world with me, and that is a Baal Gaiva, somebody who has a, an enormous ego. So if you remember the story of, of Bilam, what happens is Bolok sends to Bilam uh, an embassy, uh, a group of uh, people to summon him to come and uh, curse the Jewish people. And he speaks to Hashem, and Hashem says, "You're not. No, they're they're not. They're they're not. Uh, you you don't you don't have to go with them." Let me quickly read this to you. I don't have, uh, uh, to maybe it'll be uh, good to remind ourselves a little bit of it. I'll read it and just speed up. The elders of Moab and the elders of Midian went with charms in their hand. Rashi says they came with all sorts of magic wands and stuff, just in case he claimed they didn't have the tools for the job. We have them here. They came to Bilaam and spoke to him and said, um, with the words of Bullock, and he said to them, spend the night here, and I'll give you a response. Um, whatever Hashem says, I should do. So they waited. What happens is, God comes to Bilaam, and he says, who have they been with you? And he says, Bullock sent them to go curse the Jewish people. And Hashem says, um, you shall not go with them, and do not curse the people. Fine. So that's what he tells them. And so off they go. And then this is the key thing. The officer of Moab rose, came to Bullock, all refused to go with us, go with us. So he kept on sending officers more and higher ranking than these, it says in the English. So he sends now dukes and lords. And at that point, Hashem said, okay, you can go with them. And up he goes. And there's something very strange here. Hashem hates an egotist. Yet, for some reason, for complicated reasons, which we discussed, I think, either last year or this year, you can uh, reference that by going back to the Pasha year one or year two of Bullock. But uh, he wants uh, Bilam to play a role in blessing the Jewish people. And he wants him to be a prophet. God spoke to non Jewish prophets as well uh, for all sorts of reasons. And so he says that, okay, you can go with them. But that's strange. He seems to be endorsing the guy's ego. Uh, Bilam was uh, insulted at the standard or the level of the emissaries, uh, the ambassadors that were sent to summon him in the first place, or to ask him to come in the first place. But for more prestigious, for bigger, greater people, he allows them to go, that simply feeds his ego. It's almost as though he's endorsing his ego and his snooty dismissal of the first group of, of emissaries. So the Basilian says something very, very brilliant. What comes next? Well, there's the famous story of he's riding along with the donkey and the donkey sees the angel and Balaam doesn't see the angel and uh, the donkey simply refuses to, to uh, go any further and Balaam's hitting the thing and then a miracle happens, the donkey speaks and says, I, no, I've not always been your faithful donkey and Balaam loses his temper. Said, if I had a sword in my hand, I'd cut your head off. Now, this is astonishing. The, Bil so the, the, the Bas Ayan says this thing with Balaam is so brilliant. Hashem intentionally allows them to go with the second group. The, the second group are the big guys. Now, I'll keep the, 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 the Harry Potter analogy again. He's supposed to be able to offer a, to issue curses, and they're always killing curses. They always work. And now he can't 
uh, move forward. The donkey, the donkey's not doing what he tells him. And what does he say? If I had a sword, I'd kill you. Hey, hold on a minute. What's wrong with the Avada Kedavra? You know, the killing curse. Why? Are, as you're the great Bilam, we sought you out because you're the great Bilam, the guy who's the big magician who can do anything and curse an entire people. And you can't kill your donkey except if you've got a sword. What happened to the, whatever you say, whatever comes from your mouth, that is, you know, incredibly powerful and toxic and, and deathly. What happened to you? It just doesn't work. The fact that Hashem stalls him to allow him to go with big guys means that when he can't, as it were, blow his own trumpet, then I can assure you from uh, the two times that happened to me recently at Gateways, when you, in public, when you're embarrassed in public, it's terrible. It's like dying, which the Talmud says, it really is like killing somebody. And you should rather throw yourself into a flame and burn to death than embarrass somebody in public because you killed them. And that's more or less how they feel. That's how I felt on two occasions recently. That's how Bilam felt. And when Bilam the egotist was in public, was, was embarrassed in public in front of these great lords and jokes, then his eye fled, disappeared, shrunk. And when his eye had gone, then God could use him as a vehicle to speak the words of blessing that he wants him to issue to the Jewish people. And of course, the greatest prophet of all, as we said, is Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu's quality, his greatest quality, was humility. Whereas Avram Avinu saw himself as dust, Moshe Rabbeinu saw himself as nothing. And when you're nothing, when there's no you, then you become a keli, you become a, a, a container without any content, which allows a shem to come in and speak through you. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful idea. In fact. Well, if I turn a few pages here in the Bas Ein, he was a Talmud of the Baal Shem Tov, because the founder of the Hav And here he says, and it's a very fabulous idea, the Gomorrah, it's a Gomorrah and Shabbos and Kufta involved, and it discusses whether our Jews are, are affected by mazel or not affected by mazel. That's the planetary forces that play uh, out there or have an effect on the world, either positively or negatively. And there's a debate in the Gomorrah it, whether mazel affects the Jewish people or not. So it's called im yesh mazel Yisrael, if there is mazel Yisrael, or im ein mazel Yisrael, if there's no mazel to the Jewish people. And the Baal Shem Tov says the following thing. Ein, that's where, you're not reading it properly. Ein mazel Yisrael. Ein, which can also be meant, taken to mean nothingness, that's the mazel of Yisrael. When Yisrael feels themselves to be nothing, when they get to the level of being, you know, an Avram, when they get to the, 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 the even uh, embarrassed in public because your chauffeur won't blow, and you shrink, that's the point at which, that's where Mazel comes for as Jewish people. When we become egotists, like Bilam, mm -mm, doesn't work. There was a, a story uh, a number of years ago, I was speaking at, at, at Talmud's uh, uh, at Simcha, Another town, different town, and um, I, I, there was, I, spoke, I was invited to speak first, and uh, I, I spoke, and uh, I think it went well, uh, and I gave a, a brocha to the to the, 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 the to my Talmud's son, and I said that I would want to make a prediction that he was uh, um, going to continue the, the the trajectory, his terror trajectory, and reach enormous heights. There was another rabbi who spoke after me. And for some reason, I don't know why, but he just uh, uh, made a, a scathing comment about the fact that I said, I want to make a prediction. He started off saying, not being blessed with powers of prophecy, um, I'm not going to make any predictions. And the whole hall of people just, people looked at each other. People looked over at me and I just put my head down. And they carried on. He came up afterwards and said, and he just apologized. He said he didn't mean to... Uh, for it to imply what everybody assumed it implied. But my wife came rushing up to me and she said, did you hear what he said about you? I said, yes. Did you say that? To, did you say that? Talk to anybody about it? I said, no. Quick, come with me. And she took me to a couple who were there that hadn't had any children. She said, quick, give them a blessing. Because 
Apparently, if somebody's embarrassed in public and then gives a blessing, that blessing is profoundly powerful. Why? Because they've been embarrassed in public, their eye is automatically, it's been imposed on, of course, but automatically from without, as opposed to from within, has shrunk to nothingness. And that's the sort of person whose blessing counts enormously. I don't know if I mentioned to you in weeks gone past, but I came up with a custom uh, uh, a few months ago, uh, which I think is a nice custom. And I said this, I think when I was speaking in Canada recently, and somebody said, apparently there's some uh, uh, great rabbi who, who does this very thing. So I'm very glad that I uh, uh, piggybacked, even if unknowingly, on somebody else's idea. That is after I make, uh, I make um, Avdollah after Shabbos, I read the letter of the Ramban, the famous letter of the Ramban to his son, Shema Bini Musra Vicha, uh, listen to me, my son, to, the, to listen to the most of your father. And then he goes on to say that humility, that's the key Jewish character trait. It's a bit with the Baal Shem Tov. It says, aim, humility, feeling yourself to be nothing. That's the Muslim. The Ramban said to son, that is the key character trait. Focus on that. Work hard on that. It's not all about you. Realize you can't do it. It's not all, you're not a fixer. It's in the, it's Biyat Hashem. Just like Moshe said. Uh, that's the, the key thing. And the other thing I came up with after I do that, my wife and I, and if I'd be guests there, we invite them to say, or I will recall something in the last week, or as it were, it doesn't have to be a big thing, but something where you felt you saw a little smile from, he from heaven, a little wink, a little um, intervention in your life to make something work out well. That encourages you to remember your connection to Hashem and his connection to you. And to take that thought in the next week, realizing if you're going to have that great idea, if you're going to innovate, if you're going to have success, it comes from Hashem. If that idea, when you remind yourself of when toot, 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 you know, that chauffeur called Jess will not come and you had to hand it over to somebody else. Well, in this period, when we're focusing on how and what our relationship with us is, with Hashem, have that one in mind. Have in mind that if you want, and you can make a promise of what you want to do in the next year, have in mind you want to work on the fact, Rabban Shalom, I know any success I'm going to have comes through you. Please give me another year to make, take that idea, refine that idea, polish it, and make it deep, deeply ingrained in who and what I am. And that's probably going to be one of the best things you could do to guarantee a successful new year, which of course is what well, every single one of you, a Gemar, sorry, a, a Gemar a Sima type, uh, and, and a, a, a ceiling, a finish of this of this time period, which is a bracha for you, your family, your kahila, and of course for the whole of the Jewish people.